our third speaker uh, has set history and, and continues to play such an important role. Um, we all know him as, as the former chairman of the RNC. Uh, he was elected to that role in 2009, making history as the first African American in that role and at that point and ever since. Um, but before that, he had made history being the first African American to be elected to statewide office in Maryland when he became, in 2003, the lieutenant governor. In more recent years, he has, uh, especially over the last few years, he's continued to be a voice of reason in the chaotic, polarized political environment in which we find ourselves. Um, he is a political commentator on MSNBC. He has co-hosted the bipartisan Steel and Unger show. And now he uh, hosts a very appropriately named, for more than one reason, podcast called Man of Steel. Is that right? So, um, but one thing I'll say uh, about, uh, about Michael Steele is that he always says the hardest thing to say that needs to be said. And I've watched him do it in the worst circumstances, which would be sort of unimaginable for someone like me, but that uh, unfortunately he confronts. And he does it with such grace, always with a smile on his face, and with enormous patience. And I have to say, I wonder all the time how you do it. But I appreciate your leadership and the conscience that you've provided uh, in this environment to the party which you once led and you know, would love for you to lead again. Um, but it is my pleasure and our pleasure to welcome Michael Steele. Thank you very much. So I stand between you and dessert. <laughs> That's how we roll, OK. I just want to know what my parameters are before I get started. Uh, thank you so much. It is an incredible honor. And I, and I mentioned to, to Evan when he, he took me out to lunch. You always know when someone calls us, can we go to lunch? Something's coming, right? Uh, but um, the opportunity to, to be here and to be a part of this uh, for me, uh, is very refreshing and very rewarding, and I, I really am excited about the energy. I was particularly uh, pleased to hear uh, the senator and the congresswoman sort of lay out um, the current state inside the bubble, uh, inside the the walls and the halls of our of our governmental institutions. Um, very much uh, take to heart the the congresswoman's. Uh, optimistic glass half full uh, approach to things uh, in despite what we see and know uh, from time to time. Uh, and, and I think that glass half full works uh, and is true because of you, uh, because of the effort uh, that uh, certainly um, Surf and, and, and um, all of you out here every day, just kind of pounding away, uh, trying to make the difference, trying to make the noise, trying to rattle the cage, trying to create a freedom house for all of us to live in, a place where we can call home uh, without recrimination. Uh, so in answer to your question about how do I maintain that sort of calm, cool, collected, the boner kind of approach to things. It helps when you spend time in a monastery, uh, which I did. Uh, you learn how to recenter uh, and rethink and to refocus. So tonight, uh, because of what you've already heard, and you've heard about the policies and the programs, you've heard about the institutional movements, you've heard about the connections that people are making and all oh, let's get together and do the little kumbaya thing and we can, all, we can all get along and we can all pass legislation. You've heard all of that. And all of that is extremely important. But the one thing that matters the most in that conversation is you. Three very powerfully important words. We, the people. So my remarks tonight, which I actually sat down and wrote out, because it felt it was that important, one, out of respect for my friend Evan, uh, and two, out of respect for you. 
and three, out of a sense of actually wanting to capture what I felt. Because I typically just kind of get up and I read my audience and I go, okay, so let's, let's go to where I think you're going. Um, and after all the wine I've seen floating around the room tonight, y'all could be going a whole lot of places, so <laughs> I'm just not sure if we'll all get there together. So I figured I'd take it a little bit different. And I hope you listen. And you internalize it just a little bit. So Donald Trump is a bit like a rash. <laughs> Unsightly, irritating, and lacking in intellectual or ideological coherence. However, also like a rash, Trump cannot be safely ignored. A rash may prove inconsequential, or as in this case, it may be a symptom of a malady that's much more serious with consequences that could leave a permanent scar or worse. Since our founding, the story of this great nation largely has been about what we aspire to be. No doubt the 2016 presidential election tested that proposition as that election was more about what pissed us off. Historian Alexis de Tocqueville once noted, quote, there's nothing more dangerous than unmet expectations, end quote. And it was the unmet expectations of countless Americans since the days of Ronald Reagan that fueled the anger that defined the 2016 presidential race. We were angry at Wall Street, angry at Muslims, angry about trade deals, angry about the environment, angry about police shootings, angry at President Obama, angry at Republican obstructionism, angry about undocumented immigrants, and just plain angry at those who are angry. But it should have become clear along the way that we were allowing our anger to blind us to an immutable truth. America not only is a great country, we are a uniquely great country. American exceptionalism is not a patriotic notion. It is a welcome fact. When people around the globe dream of a better life, folks, they still dream of America. What makes America uniquely great are its ideals, articulated in the Declaration of Independence and the form of government established by the Constitution that helps each one of us achieve those ideals. But the most important ideal, quote, to form a more perfect union. Our country has, of course, witnessed appalling injustice and at times fallen far short of the ideals posited at our founding. Yet at crucial times in our history, our political institutions, political leaders, and our electorate have pushed us to meet those ideals. Through the choices we have made in scores of national elections, we have abolished slavery, expanded suffrage, and provided the conditions that fostered a standard of living far beyond anything the world could ever imagine. Moreover, our greatest leaders understood that our purpose is to work toward achieving those ideals upon which this nation was founded. More than most, President Abraham Lincoln understood that those ideals, if implemented, would be transformational. A nation conceived in liberty could and did unleash its citizenry and empower them to achieve moral and material progress so dramatic and so exemplary that it enriched not only the lives of our citizens, but citizens of the world. At Gettysburg, Lincoln called for, quote, a new birth of freedom based on our founding proposition that all men are created equal. In his farewell address to the nation, Ronald Reagan, Reagan reminded us that, quote, after 200 years, the city on the hill still stands strong and true on the granite ridge, and her glow has held steady no matter the storm. 
end quote. That freedom would be the light of this city. And the sacrifices made from Gettysburg to Iwo Jima to Fallujah and the consequential battles that took place on our neighborhood streets, across lunch counters, in our homes and workplaces, and in our courts and legislative chambers, folks, those things, those hardships, those struggles would serve as the very foundation of that city. And through it all, we, the people, remained resilient, optimistic. And when we stumbled or stood in doubt, we had leaders who lifted our spirit, strengthened our resolve, and moved our nation forward. The election of 2016, however, was different. That contest was not so much about what we aspire to be as it was about who we have become. And what that election revealed was, in some respects, many respects, very, very, very unsettling. We have learned that notwithstanding our ideals and the heroism and sacrifice of prior generations, we still remain vulnerable to appeals to baser elements in our nature. Ronald Reagan rallied Americans frustrated by the torpor of the Carter years through a message of optimism. Donald Trump identified with and gave voice to the resentments that have smoldered during the Bush and Obama years. In fact, those resentments still are felt today. Trump was unafraid of the corrosive identity politics and vilification of other. That is a demagogic staple and embraced instead their policy equals immigrant bashing, ethnic disparagement, protectionism, isolationism. We as a people, and I say as a Republican, us Republicans, are now a long way from the ideals of Lincoln and the hopeful optimism of Reagan. The problems we face are very real, and voters, particularly those maligned as deplorables and as clinging to gods and religion, to their guns and religion, are right to feel marginalized and ignored. Many of our communities, particularly those far from Washington, New York, or Silicon Valley, are afflicted by a growing despair. In turn, that despair breeds pathologies that further afflict our neighbors and even our own families. You all remember talking to folks after, six, after the 16 election who said, I just can't go to Thanksgiving dinner this year <laughs> because my mama and daddy are about to drive me absolutely crazy. I can't talk to my own parents because of one individual. I can't converse or hang out with my friends because of one individual. I can't socialize or express an opinion in fear that somehow I will disparage someone or be disparaged because of one individual. How the hell do you let that happen? Why the hell do you let that happen? We can overcome our current crisis of spirit and faith. There's no doubt to that. But to do so, we, the people, must want to do so. We are here because this is where we want to be. So stop your whining, put your big boy pants on and your big girl dress on and deal with it. This is your mess, let's fix it. We must want to heed Lincoln's example. We must want to remain faithful, to our fundamental values and ideals. But that is so hard to do. Oh my gosh, that is so hard to do. Whereas Lincoln celebrated our, our ideals and rejected self, 
We continue to be mired in one of the most unwelcome trends in American society and its politics, which was so refreshing to see the counter narrative tonight on this stage. Because what you heard from the members who were here before you was not what you typically hear from our leaders today. This unwelcome trend in America, particularly by our elected elites, is the celebration of self. President Obama, in his speech in support of Hillary Clinton at the Democratic Convention, referred to himself 119 times in support of someone else. Donald Trump doesn't know who else to talk about but himself. <laughs> by contrast, in Lincoln's two most famous speeches, the Gettysburg Address and his second inaugural, he referred to himself only in a single sentence, and there he noted that he had no more insights than any other citizen in the country. He didn't claim to know more than his generals or to know more about the courts than any other human being on the earth or to know the details of taxes better than anybody, better than the greatest CPA. The narcissism of Washington and this president not only impedes the formulation of sound policy, it has corroded our politics and made personal our agendas. An electoral or governing coalition that coalesces around a personality, a single individual, or a tweet, rather than an agenda, an idea, values, opportunity, rather than addressing the nation's needs, is not just unsustainable. Ladies and gentlemen, I tell you, it is debilitating. I've heard a lot of people say, and even tonight, we are better than this. Are we? Prove it. Prove it. Because I don't think you have the guts to prove it. I doubt you're ready to prove it. We've gotten comfortable with our tribe. And we don't want to offend our tribe. We don't want to upset the man down the street because he may say something in a tweet. We don't want to upset the status quo because, oh, there may be an angry mob outside that door. Think about the generations who've come before who had to deal with a lot more crap than we have to deal with today. Think about those folks who've had to fight through wars and segregation and anger and hatred, depression, and continue to build a nation. When I got to this part of my talk, I'm, I'm done. I have nothing else. I couldn't think of anything else to say. <laughs> I was totally done. I just, it's like, I have no ending because I don't know how this ends. We've got to help each other decide how this ends. This is not just about winning an election anymore. This is not just about my side is better than your side. I've got the upper edge, you don't. This is not zero sum politics anymore, people. I played the game, I've been inside the room. I've been in the house, I ran the party. County, state, national. I took the house. Watch these sap suckers lose it. <laughs> so I know the game. But what I know more important than the game is it's not a game when it comes to the values of this country. It's not a game when it comes to the principles we declare that we believe in. It's not a game when we watch children being caged. It's not a game when we watch families and communities being broken apart because of what? It's not a game when we promise that we're going to improve your lot and give you the tools you need, but then we decide only a select few will benefit. 
It's not a game where we turn our back on 75 years of building not just the strength of our own defenses and support here at home, but partnering with those around the globe to make sure that democracy in whatever form is decided by those communities abroad, that we are there to stand with them. It's not a game. And yet so many of our leaders treat it like a game. So many of our leaders just don't give a damn of what the outcome is for you. So I don't know how this ends. And I'm not trying to be a Debbie Down- Downer or a Michael Miserable. <laughs> I just want to leave you with some thoughts about what are you prepared to do? Well, let's start with the fact that you already are starting to do something. I'm so proud of what Evan has been able to build out of the ashes of 2016, to kind of move the nation's consciousness and its voice to the front. That's what you're doing. That's part of the ending of this series of crazy messes that we find ourselves in, right? Democracy, the word still means something. I got in a lot of trouble this past weekend with a whole lot of conservative friends. I love pissing people off. (laughs) Because I think it's unconscionable when the President of the United States declares himself a nationalist, but doesn't want to take the responsibility for what that means. So even when a member of our own military and armed services engages in white nationalist behavior, as I tweeted out, just because you put white in front of it doesn't make it less dangerous. What do we do? What are we going to do? Keep building democracy, please. Raise your voices just a little bit louder, please. Stand a little braver, a little taller in the town square, please. Take the incoming that's going to come, please. Make a difference. Push back. Make a noise. If any of this matters to you, if any of this is still relevant for future generations, please do something. Say something. Be proud Americans and get out of the shadow of one person. Because that's not where this country belongs. Thank you.